January 22nd, 2014. Uh, I'm the chair, Councilman Mike Bonin. I am joined by my colleagues Paul Koretz and Paul Krikorian. Uh, Mr. Lebon should be uh, with us shortly. Um, uh, first of all, a uh, couple uh, uh, metro-related announcements. You know, I like to talk about all different transportation stuff. Yesterday, ground was broken on the Crenshaw Line, which is phenomenal news for Los Angeles. And um, I also got uh, uh, news uh, this morning from uh, Supervisor Yaroslavsky's uh, website, uh, something which I had heard before, is that the Expo line is exceeding ridership expectations. It's already carrying 27,000 riders a day. That's exceeding its 2020 uh, expectations. And keep in mind, it's only halfway built. So uh, looking good on the mass transit. Uh, so multimodal roll call. Uh, last two weeks, uh, who's been uh, commuting on a bike? Mr. Mucker, are you raising your hand back there? <laughs> uh, uh, bus or train? Uh, who's been doing some pedestrian heavy activity? Any segues in the room? Just thought I'd check. Uh, okay, <clears throat> so we're going to begin. Uh, I've had requests uh, by the makers of the motions to uh, continue items two and three. And um, Paul, was there a third one? Just two and three? Okay. Continue items two and three. And um, unless uh, any of my colleagues have an objection, we're going to move items four, seven, and eight on consent. Excuse me, Mr. Chair, for item four, we have some technical uh, recommendation changes with language that we'll distribute, but if you could um, approve that as amended. Uh, okay. Colleagues in agreement on that? Yes. Okay. All right. So uh, we will then go to the balance of the agenda, and we will start with item number one. Item number one is a communication from the mayor relative to the appointment of Mr. Rudy Espinosa to the Board of Transportation Commissioners. Good morning. Good afternoon. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> that was a test to see how alert you are. You're now qualified to serve. Thank you. All right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah don't, don't do that to Mr. Weston and Council. Okay, I definitely won't. <laughs> uh, so uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what your interest is in serving? Sure, sure. Uh, my name is Rudy Espinoza. Uh, I'm an urban planner by training. I went to school at UCLA. I've been uh, living in the city for about 10 years. Um, my background is in economic development, and I started my work uh, working at a small consulting firm in Hollywood, helping financial institutions invest responsibly in low-income neighborhoods. Um, after that, I went to go work at a national uh, foundation called the AARP Foundation, and I was helping them invest their resources to support low-income seniors um, in Los Angeles. And then I went to go work uh, most recently at a, at a nonprofit lender in South Los Angeles working with micro-entrepreneurs. Um, currently, I'm the executive director of a nonprofit community development organization called Leadership for Urban Renewal Network. Um, and we do a lot of uh, urban policy work, we do economic development work, and we support our partners through, through consulting work that helps uh, make a better city. And that's, uh, that's me. Uh, great. You mentioned that uh, you do work in economic development, and you have background in planning. Mm -hmm. You obviously have a keen interest in transportation. So. Uh, can you tell me what your definition of transit-oriented development is? Transit-oriented development is, uh, is something that sort of facilitates, um, it facilitates folks using transit in an easy way. Um, it, it, makes, it makes transportation the, the, the easiest way for them to get to their job or to the, to the place where they want to go. Um, and it's some place where uh, they don't have to walk very far or even drive to get to that transit. Um, but a transit-oriented development, at least the successful ones that I've seen, are places um, that are really centers of activity in a community. They're not sort of marginalized or far off. They're actually, they actually become centers or hubs where a lot of folks do a bunch of activities, and it's a place where entrepreneurs can even be successful. Any successful examples you can point to? Um, I, I spend a lot of time in Boyle Heights. So, uh, I mean, I, I think what, what's happening around Mariachi Plaza is really exciting. Um, there's, there's a lot of activity on First Street, and there's a lot of new businesses that are, that are uh, coming up. Um, but then there's also a lot of sort of in events that, that are happening, music festivals, there's a weekly farmer's market, um, and I think there's a lot of opportunity to do that across the city. 
Uh, what do you think your primary focus would be? What do you really want to focus on as a commissioner? Um, I think, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think the role that I could play is to make sure that, um, that the commission is, is thinking about the needs of, of the constituents of Los Angeles and always thinking about how, how do we make sure that any sort of transit policy or tra transportation oriented programs put people first. And that's, uh, that's all the work that I do is really focus on making sure that we always go back and, and listen to what folks have to say. And so I hope that I could contribute that to, to the commission. Uh, where'd you go to high school? I went to Covina High School. <laughs> that, that was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you know what a smudge pot is? <laughs> you do? No, I don't. Does anybody know what a smudge pot is? I know what a smudge pot is. <laughs> yeah, but well, that means we're old, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> John Muckley knows. Okay, good. Uh, colleagues, any questions for Mr. Just to, to clarify, in, the, in our youth, Mr. Kokoi and I, and Mr. Muckry, if we did have a chance to watch uh, news on the TV, they'd say, and tomorrow in Covina, they have to turn the smudge pots on to keep the, uh, the fruit trees uh, warm mm. because of a cold snap. And that's what it was. And there was a lot of groves out there. Is that right, Mr. True. Muckry? That, that's true. Very good. Okay, thank you. I, I used a manual typewriter once. Very good, okay. Colleagues, anybody have questions? No? Go ahead. I'm just wondering, when you, when you come in, do you have any goals uh, that, that you see for us in terms of transportation in L.A.? Well, you know what? I think that one of the biggest assets that Los Angeles has, especially in low-income neighborhoods, is, is the streets and things that we already have. That, those are assets that, that we have to activate a little bit more. Um, and so I'm really looking forward to figuring out how we can explore doing that and, and engaging the community in that. Um, it could be something as simple as like a pop-up sort of business in, in, a vacant, in a vacant retail space, or it could be something where, hey, you know, this street is, is too fast. How do we slow it down? And how do we get people out on the weekends and walking around? And there's a lot of things that already exist that we can leverage, um, including our streets and including our sidewalks. Very good. Thank you. All right. Uh, we will, I believe, unanimously uh, recommend uh, your confirmation to the full city council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your willingness to serve. Yeah, thank appreciate you. it. That brings us to item number five, which is an Englander Blumenfeld Bonin Krikorian motion instructing DOT to report relative to the city's crossing guard program. All right, step, come forward, please. Uh, is there anybody here from Mr. Englander's office? Are we done with this? One and two? Three. Uh, would, would you like an opportunity to sort of uh, frame the motion and, and explain uh, what sure. Mr. Englander would like to see? Okay. Uh, good afternoon, council members. My name is Brian O from Council Member Englander's office. And uh, this motion was put uh, pretty recently um, in light of some information that the council member had. Uh, received regarding one of the programs that DOT uh, offers in Crossing Guard, in the cross, Crossing Guard program. Um, and he wanted to just have some more information on, uh, you know, kind of procedures and kind of the system that's in place for how we, um, you know, look at the performance and uh, kind of the procedures that go into this program. So put that motion forward for that. Thank you. Uh, Gentlemen, I'd like to introduce yourself. Good afternoon, Greg Savelli, Department of Transportation. Um, we have received some of the uh, information that they requested, and we are gathering that data. We're more than happy to present that uh, information for for the council. Uh, and I'm here today to answer any questions you may have on the program. This is a program that's been in the city for many, many years. Started out as a contract program. Uh, uh, changed over to a city program about 20 plus years ago and uh, at its peak we had 600 or question 605 requests for locations to be covered at the max we had 490 to 500 guards currently the program is um, through the budget cuts and through the different things that the city's been doing we're down to 390 crossing guards um, and they are distributed throughout the city based on need. Uh, the crossing uh, intersections are rated A, B, and C for, for the level of priority, A being the highest, meaning no controls, uh, B being some type of control or crossing or a stop sign, and then C being less uh, priority with a signalized intersection of some type. 
um, and those are evaluated uh, by need um, by the supervision as well as some of them are uh, council authorized. So a council member can authorize uh, a crossing guard for a specific intersection if they provide the funding for it and that person would not be moved generally. Um, and so that's how the system uh, was set up. Uh, currently, the system, with, as with all city programs, has lost a number of members due to the fact of retirements, illnesses. Um, the average age of our crossing guard is 65 to 70 years old, mostly retired folks who have the time to spend with the children in the mornings and afternoons. It requires uh, two appearances for the, you know, in and out of school. Um, I'm not sure how long ago, but a while back, they used to do it three times, and part of the uh, process was for uh, the guards to come back in the middle of the day, and uh, when they eliminated the middle of the day crossing for uh, schools that no longer opened up, uh, it kept everybody on campus, they uh, found a way to provide a bonus system to where the uh, guard, if they showed up for the second time instead of just the first, they would have to provide a bonus. That's part of the negotiated uh, MOU language and uh, so that's part of the, the the cost of the program at this point is just a little bit over four million dollars um, that we provide to the city. Uh, so you said there's about 390 crossing guards? Correct. Are those all part-time positions? All part-time. And uh, the budget's about four million you said. What was it at its peak? Uh, say over six. Over six. And um, how long ago was the peak? Uh, approximately four years ago. Yes. Carl, Lieutenant Carl Jones is here as well. He's been the program coordinator for the last four years, so he's here to back us up if we have any questions we can't answer. And what's the, the, the uh, other than the council created positions, what's the funding source? Is it general fund or is there a, a, a different revenue source? Uh, ultimately, all of our people are paid, all the crossing guards are paid through the traffic safety fund. Uh, how the, the transfers are done, I'm not 100% sure. Uh, has uh, LAUSD ever borne any uh, any part of the cost for crossing guards? Not currently. This is one of the programs that years ago when cities were trying to help school districts, uh, we offered as, uh, as, not in kind, but we offered to pay this service rather than give money directly to the schools. And that's part of the reasons why they don't pay at this time. Uh, do you know, and, and if you don't, and well, either way, if you conclude it in the report, what other municipalities do if, if they pay for the cost themselves or if they share it with the school district or if there's other uh, private funding sources that, that help support? I've had the unique experience of working at six different cities, and each one provides this service for the school districts in most cases. For example, my most recent experience at Hermosa Beach was that they contracted it out, but it was paid for by the city through uh, to all city management. And uh, the crossing guards, are they generally stationed sort of right at the school, or are they, do they, are they stationed at crossings where large numbers of students tend to pass en route to school, but not necessarily immediately in front of it? Both. Some of them are on what they call the safe route to school program. So where there are large crossings, they would be at those intersections, which may serve multiple schools. And then there are others that are located directly at some of the schools. And, and so how is all that determined? I mean, safe routes for schools exist, but is there something about pedestrian volumes that you examine or anything? Yeah, we, the, uh, by, by count, by the pedestrian counts, um, and uh, they'll, they'll go back and check. And again, keep in mind that we only cross elementary school by uh, city, go, city ordinance. So we evaluate where the elementary schools are. So uh, there, you know, I live on a street in between an elementary school and a middle school. Uh, so obviously the, the students tend to you know, walk the same routes. If, if there were kids going by, you, if, if they appeared to be just middle school kids, they, they wouldn't accompany them on the crossing, just the elementary school kids? They're, they're generally trained not to because of the ordinance, but some of them will cross. Um, but we have had concern while you know, a, a um, lady with a baby carriage is crossing and we didn't go out and cross. That's the reason. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, my, my staff, uh, when we saw that this motion went in, started making some calls to uh, pedestrian advocates uh, uh, here in Los Angeles to try to get a sense of what the, the protocols are, the procedures that are, are used with crossing guards in other cities. 
there doesn't seem to be a lot has of, of of study of that comparatively. Have have you guys done any of that? Yeah, we attempted to do it. As you recall, our prior general manager was very um, interested in data to support different things, and we did search uh, just in the two years that I've been here for this data, and we, there isn't anything readily available. And uh, final question for me. You know, I imagine there's quite a bit of sensitivity uh, for parents. Uh, who are concerned about their children, about the, the background procedures, background checks for, for crossing guards. What are they right now? Uh, they run through the, the city, uh, and because of the sensitive nature and involving children, their fingerprints are run through the state system to find out if they have any convictions. The, the Megan that, Laws database and stuff? Yes, but it's only computerized. We don't do door checking. We don't uh, check with the neighbors or anything like that. Okay. Uh, colleagues, anybody have questions? Mr. Koretz? Yeah, just uh, want to know how much, uh, how much less safe we think kids are now that we've made the cuts that we've made to uh, the crossing card program in the last few years. Have we been able to uh, feel somewhat confident that we've prioritized the right places uh, uh, and that by and large uh, kids are, are close to as safe as they were before? Or do we feel there's some danger? Um, by the cuts we've made, and whoever wants to answer that. Uh, it'd be my judgment that, um, that we do the best we can with what we have, and we do evaluate and eliminate as signals go in, as conditions change, as populations at the schools change. We do reevaluate. In fact, we reevaluate uh, uh, now on a more regular basis than before uh, to try to determine what intersections truly need the assistance. Uh, as far as I, I can't put a, uh, a yes or no, whether they're safer or less safe, um, just based on, on what we do. Um, so I really couldn't answer that question. Do you have a sense of it? I mean, we, we obviously have had to cut in a number of safety-related places. Um, certainly where we've done that uh, with fire safety, we've seen a slower response time. We know there's a certain amount of of danger, do we have do we have a sense that because we're we're obviously eliminating the the least crucial places and signals go in and stop signs go in, do we have a sense that this has been yes we do reasonably safe or do we have the feeling that you know, oh my God if we could only throw in an extra hundred thousand dollars you know there's still some intersections that we feel uncomfortable with that we're not covering before a, a, a guard is removed from any intersection. Uh, the intersection is resurveyed uh, to see if it actually meets the criteria or the warrant for a crossing guard and before any guard is removed from the intersection. Normally the guards that are removed from an intersection, it doesn't meet the criteria for a crossing guard anymore. And that's how we, we remove them. But to further answer that question, we, as, you, as I mentioned at the beginning, there, there have been 605 requests, and those requests are based on usually the school or the families or the people that use those intersections. We, at, if everybody's here, the best we can cover is 390. John Luckley, General Manager, Department of Transportation. I think we're at great risk by look, not funding this program. The department gives tens of millions of dollars back in various revenues back to the city to fund the general fund. Our, traffic officers are crossing guards are funded from the traffic safety fund. I don't want to mislead anybody in this room or in the council to think that this group is not in jeopardy in this budget. I want to keep it in the budget. I'm going to be asking for more funds for the department. I want to hire 60 more crossing guards right now. We need to make uh, public transport our safety pedestrian safety a priority in the city. We've had too many close calls and too many deaths not to look at this while we're gathering the data. So it's a very critical uh, program to the city. It's underfunded. We're understaffed. And these men are trying to give you the political answer. I'm going to give you the straight answer. We need more. Thank you. Uh, I know, Mr. Muckley, you just arrived, but how many people were injured in crossing uh, in the streets in calendar year 2013. I can't give you that number, but I can tell you since I've been general manager, we've had two crossing guard actually crossing guards involved in accidents from from doing their job. One thing I haven't done, members, and I want to do, I want to go over and see uh, Commander Smith 
Because I think our data collection, whether it's fire, police, and if you've ever been in a firehouse and look at their form, uh, there's about 95 checks. I don't know if they're up to date with the modern statistics that we want to try to get. No, they are not. You know, uh, but, you know, who is responsible? I don't know how many accidents they are. I can tell you just in reminiscing right now, there's a crossing guard at Clinton and Hoover. The school is three blocks away. The reason there's a crossing guard is the streetcar used to come up Hoover to Clinton and went out uh, Temple to where Cedars of Lebanon was. Again, I don't know, maybe just me, Paul, and John will know where that was before Cedar Sinai was. And that's why that crossing guard has always been there, and that's because it's a tough part of Hoover. Right by street lighting DWP yard on Hoover, this is near Melrose Avenue in the East Hollywood, if you call it that area. Um, there is a, a situation where there's a defined moment where LA Unified says this is our responsibility and this is the city's. I don't want that argument. I, we have this. We are crossing guard people. And Lieutenant Jones is one of the best public employees in all the system of the city of Los Angeles and his passion to teach people about uh, what they have, the various uh, valet service, I guess, is, what do they call it? School valet, where School the parents valet. help get the cars in and around. And all this is a big, big, big challenge. I think we do need the numbers of what take place there. I, I, I don't know if I've ever told you. I was hit by a car. First car stopped, second car didn't. I think I was 13 years old. I was in county territory. And a sheriff picked me up because some mother saw me in a bad arm. And she, you know, the, it was a hit and run. The point being, crosswalks are, I want people to be afraid to cross the street and not think it. I, don't, I, I know there's some advocates who think peace and love Streets are a tough place. People have a lot going on, and they're not always concentrating. School safety zones. I do want the police department to have a chief of, uh, of uh, traffic. There's no chief of traffic in there like they used to have. To really concentrate on this area for enforcement, there's three things. You know the three E's, don't you? Can I tell you the three E's? I suspect you're about to. Okay, good. The most important thing, it's called education, enforcement, and engineering. And the engineers will go out and look at a situation and put in a new signal out at Franklin in Commonwealth. But it's right next to a school. Everybody loves the crossing guard. They don't want to get rid of the crossing guard, so the crossing guard stays, even though the signal was put in there for that safety issue. And enforcement is, is when the police department comes, because you don't move people. But today I did see an officer at 815. Unfortunately for the parent, they had their car in the no parking zone, and there was unattended and they want it cleared near the school. So there's all these combinations that are basic skills that have to be reinvented. Today, out on Wilshire Boulevard, as we looked at a new project that we're doing for the busway, uh, uh, an individual on a bike was just coming right through, and he yelled at us, hey, out of the way, we're on a sidewalk. And I'm thinking, okay, when is the collision going to happen? Not physically, but where we all had to get together and, and re-educate everybody both the motors for the cyclists, both the cyclists on a sidewalk, and I think Michelle Mallory says it best, if they, walk, if they ride at walking speed, it's acceptable. But he was barreling down the street. There's so many things here, but it's good to revisit this. And I just, the one second question may even go back, and I don't know if there's any old timers. What do uh, the other, and I think it's 19 cities in LA Unified do for crossing guards that we don't do? Uh, what do they do in Maywood Bell? What do they do in San Fernando City? What do they do in uh, Carson? That it's in LA Unified, Unincorporated County. How do they do that? Should we look at that situation so we make sure on the right? I think it's so important, traffic safety around schools, and uh, this is a good time to maybe look at it. But I think there's one thing I would do, Eric, if I was mayor, I always like to use that line. I would form a joint use committee on this issue with LA because the police department now has, excuse me, the school police now is a factor that's very important to, to LA Unified uh, before that. And they even have officers on motorcycles, uh, LA Unified. So I think there needs to be a relook to make sure everybody's pulling the rope the right way. And the good thing, and Chief, I appreciate that. Totally out of bounds question, Mr. Chairman. Great job, LA DOT for the uh, Tournament of Roses, the Rose Parade, and the National Championship game. LADOT, on a contract basis, is approved to do traffic direction to help augment City of Pasadena, the county sheriffs, and you guys did a great job. So uh, I got, uh, I got uh, one of the greatest compliments when I was driving through 
uh, Pasadena. There was a DOT officer. It was dark. And I just said, good job, DOT. And I was already past the intersection. And he said, thank you, Councilman. He recognized my voice. So, I mean, it felt me real good because they are out there and serving our region, which is very good, Chief. Thank, thank you, Mr. John. Jones. Mr. Krikorian? Yeah. Um, first of all, let me say, and I think Mr. Buckery, what you just said about having two crossing guards recently injured is a pretty good example of how important uh, this job is. Uh, and, you know, our employees are putting themselves at risk uh, for our kids. And so I appreciate Mr. LeBunch giving a shout out to Lieutenant Jones and, and the troops who are out there uh, helping to keep our kids safe. And it's, it's an increasingly difficult job. Uh, we expect crossing guards to keep kids safe, but we don't seem to do anything about the parents who are dropping kids off while they're, you know, pulling U-turns in the middle of the street while talking on their phone and smoking a cigarette. Um, it, it just never ceases to amaze me as I spend any time around elementary schools and see the idiocy of drivers. And so um, in the, it, that makes the job even harder for the crossing guards. And, and uh, Mr. Muckery, I appreciate your, you know, concerns about the budget and reduction of forces. Obviously, if we have more, we're going to be doing better. But I think the focus of this motion arose out of not how many crossing guards we have or where they're stationed or how we prioritize where they're stationed. It has more to do with uh, process of how we handle this program now. Uh, and specifically, it rose out of an unfortunate incident when a child was injured. Um, and the allegation was that a crossing guard had acted um, with improperly in leading the child out into the street. I'm not going to revisit that case or talk about that specific issue, but I think that the, what we want to hone in on is what are the protocols? What is the training involved when someone is has a medical condition that impedes their ability to do the job, how do we address that situation and bringing them back? Um, what's the oversight that's provided to individuals who are on the job? Um, so those are the sorts of things that uh, I'm going to be looking for when the report comes back uh, to focus in on how can we make sure that our crossing guards are kept as safe as they can be by our practices and the kids that they're serving are, are kept as safe as they can be. Thank you. Uh, we have one speaker card. Uh, which is uh, Jorge Sanchez from Teamsters. Uh, Greg, if you could stay up, because I'm going to have a question for you when he's done. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> Commission, thanks uh, for accepting me, my, com my public comments. Um, my name is Jorge Sanchez. I am the Teamster business agent for the Crossing Guards. Um, they are represented by uh, Teamsters Local 911. Um, and I want to echo uh, General Mac Manager uh, Muckry's uh, statement, which is uh, we are at a critical stage right now with the Crossing Guard program. Uh, at its height, it was technically about 520 employees, but because uh, these part-time employees now have to go through managed hiring hall, um, their process of hiring more is limited because, again, they've got to go through managed hiring uh, hall to do that. I don't know when that process started for part-timers, but it is what it is. However, my comments are uh, this afternoon uh, extemporaneous. They're off the cuff uh, from the heart, and that is simply to say that we've lost two more crossing guards uh, just this weekend, um, uh, tragically via uh, both dying. Uh, one had cancer, of course. The other had a massive heart attack. But with that, that means there's two, two more less bodies that we now have. Um, injuries, again, constitute a majority of our folks going down. Um, and I, I simply want to, again, plead to this commission that some way, somehow, uh, we get some more funding uh, to DOT to have these positions, these 60 positions filled so we can get corners covered um, and your constituencies happy, if you will, that their, their kids are, are protected. Um, and again, I thank you for allowing me to address you uh, this afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Uh, Chief, you've heard, you've, you've read the motion. Uh, you've heard a lot of the feedback from the council members. Uh, how long uh, do you need to prepare this report and get it back to us? Uh, we can have it back in a couple of weeks or 
whenever you're, you, 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 we have most of the data here, we're just still trying to tie it up. Uh, just briefly, I can tell you that, um, you know, we have an annual retraining, they all have to show up for that. Our leads are required to go out and check and watch them perform to make sure they can do the job. So we have these things in place and I'll be happy to report back in a couple of weeks. Okay, uh, then we'll, we'll, we'll say we'll have it on the calendar in 30 days, but get the report in sooner, you can share it with the council members and, and, and get more public feedback that way. Um, uh, everybody on board with that? Yeah, I just want to say also look at there's a couple of national walk to school days and some civic events that we just tie in. What do we do? I really want to try to make the nexus through LA Unified. A lot happens when whoever the principal is in this area. I think uh, one person who could get elected uh, if they did run for office usually is the crossing guard. He's much loved by the children and by the, the families and all that. But just to, we always have to. Spring training comes around every year because you got to learn how to hit the curveball. You got to learn how to run and catch a ball. It's just very important to retool and that. So everybody's comments were real good. But I, I do want to, I don't know who the superintendent is, and I used to, maybe one of my deputies does. Any, no, we're LA Unified. There used to be one who was the Dan Isaac guy who think who had all this stuff. There was one person, I'm not sure. I think it would be helpful to have the, who's your liaison at LA Unified? Bradley Smith. Bradley, Bradley Smith. And, and they also had to retool a lot of their works because their protocols and different things around school. So this is a good thing to discuss. So. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yep. While, while the chief and the lieutenant are here, I just also want to say that Caroline is doing a great job at Carpenter, by the way. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, good job. Uh, and while, while they're leaving the table, uh, Mr. Marker, I just wanted to say one thing. Uh, you don't need to come up. It's okay. Uh, I just wanted to thank you and acknowledge that I think it was very important and significant that the general manager of LA's Department of Transportation made such a forceful argument on behalf of pedestrian safety. Uh, whether you take a car or a bus or a train or you bicycle in Los Angeles, you're also at least part of the day a pedestrian. And uh, I think we're getting to a place in Los Angeles where we're paying more attention to pedestrian safety. And I think it's, it's significant and I'm very grateful to hear you be such a forceful advocate for pedestrians in Los Angeles. Thank you. Uh, next item. Item number six is a Krikorian Koretz motion instructing DOT to update the 2005 community needs assessment to incorporate significant changes in population demographics, transportation needs, and transit infrastructure in the San Fernando Valley. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Krikorian, you were the maker of the motion. Would you care to uh, introduce it and lead off on the questioning? Uh, yeah, I, I think um, it can be introduced very briefly. Uh, this is just an attempt to try to uh, bring up to date the community <coughs> needs assessment that was last done nearly a decade ago to evaluate whether or not our uh, DASH resources are being used in the most effective way and how we can um, improve uh, both their utility uh, and their connectivity with other parts of the transit system. So um, I'm eager to move forward so we can take a fresh look, especially when you consider how much transportation infrastructure has changed since 2005. Um, how much commerce has changed, how much, um, how many other things have changed about um, the, the demographics and the, the layout of our city in that decade. Uh, I think it's time that we that we update and evaluate and, and take a fresh look at, at our dash lines. So that's the point of this. Uh, would you like to uh, ask any questions? Okay. No. Um, uh, wanted to ask if it would be a, a friendly amendment for you if we could expand the scope of the study so we do it for, for the entire city and not just the valley? I think that's absolutely in order and it's a wise investment of funds. Uh, I'll also, uh, I'll sort of uh, a preface a motion I'd like to introduce tomorrow that I think will be a good companion piece to this is that uh, in addition to a, a, a periodic needs assessment, which is extremely valuable for the city, it's also important that every few years we do a line-by-line -line analysis of the existing lines and see uh, if they're functioning, whether or not they should be uh, 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 removed. And we usually do that every three years. I think the last one was 2010. So. Uh, tomorrow or Friday morning, I'll put in a motion asking that we do the line-by-line -line analysis. I'd invite you to join me on that motion so we can do these on a parallel track and do the whole picture. And actually, I was assuming that that kind of analysis would be a part of this, so that's absolutely...
consistent with what I want to accomplish with this as well. Excellent. So. Mr. Obama. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say, you know how the name DAS came along there, Mr. Bonner? Huh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I just do that because what I love reading about the paper about you, you're so high tech. I just wanted to get the old school out. <laughs> Little thing. Downtown Area Short Hop. That was DASH. That's the acronym for downtown, which yeah. started in the Civic Center. And now it's grown. And I think it's very good to look at it. I would make one suggestion because I think Mr. Kokoyan is trying to focus. If we did it regionally and, and, and let them roll, I mean, look at it globally, but look at it regionally. Look at the valley. First, look at the west side or whatever, look at the central city in a region, because how it's supposed to be a backbone. Correct me if I'm wrong, but much of this spawned out of downtown when the MTA or RTD at the time got rid of a lot of lines that were non-performing lines. And the city stood up and said, we want to get in that business. Is that correct? That's correct. Give a little history for the members. Um, the Downtown Dash actually was operated, Jim Lefton with the Department of Transportation. Um, the Downtown Dash, was, before it was Downtown Dash, was the Downtown Mini Ride, which was operated by Metro since the early 70s. Um, in 1985, the city had been accumulating Proposition A dollars, and we felt that we'd be better served to contract out the service and operate it ourselves rather than having Metro do the service. So we started in downtown with one route. We're now up to four weekday routes. and, and the success in downtown spawned community dash services throughout the city. We now have 25 services throughout the city as well. Uh, let me ask a question. I read once that, uh, and I don't know if this is true, but I read once that it cost the city $15,000 every time there was a new council file created. So rather than me doing a separate motion on the line-by-line -line analysis, uh, Mr. Clerk, is it okay if we just amend this to include the line-by-line -line analysis as well? Yes, it is. Good. Just save 15000 bucks. Uh, I don't think it's 15000 bucks, but it's something. It is something, so I think that's a good way to do it. That's what they said when the neighborhood councils wanted to create council funds. All right, but the one other thing I wanted to say, I would also like them to look at, James, because you're doing it now, but just to sell that. You ever been to Laguna Beach? They got open air transit, okay? You've been to Santa Barbara? Open air transit. Sometimes it's fun. Transit's fun, you know, if they see it's open air. I was behind a dash bus today, one of your old ones on Franklin Avenue, and it is a big vehicle. You know, it's not a minivan or something. I also would say, is it possible to do any complimentary smaller vehicles? Because I don't know the numbers on each one, but I do try to count the heads when I see it. And I know you're trying to do a great job, but sometimes there's two or three or six. I've never seen it except a uh, 608, but a 608, I think, is a uh, metro. metro line. That's a short little dash bus. <laughs> but it is packed as a pack could be. It goes uh, to there. So I just think we should look at that and see what, what, what the future holds and how it will complement. Because the one thing I haven't achieved, so I lay this out to my colleagues who have a longer term possibly here at the big house at first in Maine, is I always wanted to have, not don't refer to the big house. Oh, I didn't know that, Paul. Oh, you used to work in this state. I got it. Okay. If, if there was a red car taxi, now the red car was the greatest thing, but at these, where, where transit crosses at, at Chandler and Lancashire, that's a hub. And if there was a taxi there that said, okay, within a, a, a mile of the zone, all the three of us could jump in and the driver's going to drop us off, it's going to be a buck or two each, just to get the backbone going. I think what we're seeing very rapidly is the success of the MTA's master plan with the Expo line uh, and what is going on and also you see that people can come to LA and not be in a car and live off of the the red line and uh, again John and I we, we worked together so many times the old tough part of East Hollywood uh, where there was tough motels are now tourist motels hipster motels where people stay in L.A. and they don't need a car because they can go all the way from Expo, Expo Park to L.A. Live to Universal, etc. But this whole concept, I think it's good to look at what's the new transit. And where are you on, uh, is it Butterfly or Pink uh, Mustache or what's those places? Uh, what's that called, that new thing? That's a high-tech thing, uh, Mike. The, the, the rideshare company? Rideshare, yeah. 
we, yeah. we, we had a three-hour discussion about that in council one day. Right. Uh, and Mr. Le Mr. Uh, Wesson is not allowing me wearing necktie to council anymore because he was blaming my necktie for the problem. For that thing. That but the point being, all this evolution is taking place on people trying to move people, you know, and how they do it, how they change. So I don't want to load you up, James. No, I think you I, know I what. Let's make a couple of real quick comments. Yeah. First off, um, based on your... Leadership and strong advocacy, we've included funding in the proposed FY 1415 budget for two open air trolleys. So I want you to be the first to hear that. Um, second, uh, we just we concur strongly with uh, the motion that was put forward. Um, we, we have plans to work on a scope of work to do both a line by line analysis and an update to the dash need assessment study. Um, in years past, it wasn't feasible to update it because we were facing serious shortfalls. So there really wasn't a point. But with the service changes and revenue increases we obtained in 1011 and the economy improving, we do think it's an ideal time to revisit the study. And um, we look forward to working with the council on that endeavor. Great. I'd also ask to, to be, that you be sort of um, anticipatory as well of the, of the new uh, patterns that might be emerging as the, the new rail systems Absolutely. come on, the new uh, BRPs come on. Into account. Yep. Uh, Mike, I just one thing too. Again, and John Mucker and I will remember. I don't know if Paul will remember, but on on the Santa Monica Boardwalk and into Venice, there was these uh, little c trams that ran there. Mm -hmm. You know, and it came before you came from Massachusetts, but it came along. And people, open air, open air. People like if you go to San Francisco Pier 39, they have the exact replica of a cable car, but it has r rubber wheels. I told Mr. Weezer, I could go for the streetcar down uh, Broadway, but let's run rubber wheels for a while just so people want to look at it. And there was a story in the Orange County Register once that said, make vehicles look fun. Make them look different and you'll, you'll find that. In the open air, though, it does provide it. I know West Hollywood does the thing with open air and a little shuttle on Friday night. So there's some concepts here that really could be done that we could take advantage of. So it's a good discussion. Thank you. Mr. Kretz, anything? Okay. Thank you, James. Thank you. Are you old enough to remember the train down there? Okay, so we'll approve that as amended to expand to the entire city and do the line by line yeah. analysis. I, and that uh, wraps up the agenda, am I correct? And there's no general public comment card? No, there's two. Uh, yeah. Item 7 and 8. Already approved. Oh. Yeah, we moved that. All right, so there's no further, uh, nothing further, and we will stand adjourned. Thanks, everybody.